Today we're going to be looking at another very influential Greek philosopher called Parmenides, who was born about 515 BC and died sometime after 450 BC. He came from Elia, a Greek foundation in southern Italy, and he gathered a group of other philosophers around him, the most well known being Zeno, uh, familiar to many of us for arguing that motion is impossible and Achilles can't overtake the tortoise. Now Parmenides' famous work is called On Truth and it's divided into three sections, uh, a prologue and then the way of truth and then the way of seeming. And of course one of the questions we're going to be looking at is if you've written the way of truth, why write the way of seeming? He's a very difficult philosopher, so before we look at what exactly he says, I want to find a way in to the topics he discusses by asking you to think about two sentences. The first is, nothing exists, and the second, nothing does not exist. So I want you to think about these sentences for a moment and see what they mean to you. And now I want you to add inverted commas around the word nothing in each sentence. Nothing exists. Nothing does not exist. And I want you to think about whether those inverted commas change the meaning of the sentences in each case. Parmenides' chief interest is in this question of what really exists. And the answer he comes up with is the Greek term esti. Now, we'll be looking later at exactly how we translate that, but for now, let's just translate it as isness or being. So he thinks there is just one thing, being. All the things that we normally think exist, you, me, that tree, this table, they don't really exist, they just appear to exist. All that really exists is being. So now let's look at his poem on truth in a little more detail. And of course the first question is why does he choose to write in poetic form at all? Now an easy answer might be well at this time there is no particular tradition of writing philosophy in prose. To be honest there's no particular tradition of writing philosophy, it's a very new discipline. Though that's true I think there are some more interesting positive reasons. The metre he chooses is the dactylic hexameter, which is the metre that Homer uses in his great epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey. So of course one uh, other reason that Parmenides might use this metre is to invest his own poem with epic authority. He may also want to create a distance between himself as the author and the literary persona of himself that he creates within the poem. Now there's also a third reason that I want us to consider as we continue our discussion, but I'll just suggest it for now. And that is that maybe Parmenides wants to imply that both the way of truth and the way of seeming are in some sense metaphorical and need to be uh, depicted in poetic form. If we turn now to the prologue, we'll find quite a strange scene because in it, Parmenides shows us a young version of himself, a youthful Parmenides, being led on a horse-drawn chariot, guided by maidens, towards a rather mysterious goddess. And this goddess says that she's going to tell the young Parmenides everything. She says, you must learn all things, both the unwavering heart of persuasive truth and the opinions of mortals in which there is no true trust. And of course, immediately we, we think to ourselves, well, why is the goddess telling Parmenides this deceitful, untrustworthy way of seeming as well as the uh, credible way of truth? And this in turn gives rise to the key question, what exactly is the relationship between the way of truth and the way of seeming? So let's now embark on the extraordinary and challenging way of truth.
Now, I think that a good way of approaching this is to view it as an attempt by Parmenides to ask how much he can find out from first principles without begging any questions at all. And in that sense, uh, it seems similar to me to Descartes' cogito, I think, therefore I am. So, the argument for esti in the way of truth. So far, we've translated this word esti as isness or being, but it's time to say a bit more about it. Because literally in Greek, it can either mean it is or they are. Now that might seem puzzling, but there's a one bit of Greek grammar that you need to know, and I promise you it's going to be the only bit of Greek grammar you'll need to know. In ancient Greek, neuter plural nouns take a singular verb. So if you see SD on the page, you do not know whether the subject is singular or plural. So though Parmenides is going to argue for a singular subject being, he's not cheating. He's not assuming a singular subject by using a necessarily uh, singular verb. So having got that bit of grammar under our belts, now let's go through the argument. The first premise that uh, Parmenides makes is uh, being or not being, isness or isn'tness. In the Greek, it's esti or ouk esti. And he says, this is the choice you have to make, being or not being. There is no middle way. You can't have something which both a bit exists and a bit doesn't exist. The second premise he makes, and it's a really interesting premise, and it's one we'll be returning to, is you think, you think. And of course, we saw this premise uh, in the prologue because the goddess was assuming that she was talking to a, a thinking young Parmenides. So here are two premises, being or not being, esti or ukesti, and you think. What do you think? He says, well, okay, we have the choice, put the two together. You've only got, a, you've got the choice between being or not being. So you must think either being or not being, esti or ukesti. That's your choice. You put the two premises together. There is no third way. However, you cannot think not being. You can't think nothing. To think nothing is not to be thinking at all. You can't close your eyes and think nothing. Try it now. You can't do it, can you? You're thinking space, you're, some, some image of, sort of empty space or something has come into your head. You can't think nothing. It would be failing to think. Therefore, you think the only other option, which is being something, esti. Okay, so going from that argument, uh, being or not being, and you think as the premises, therefore you think either being or not being, but you can't think not being, it can't be done, therefore you think being, esti. So to help us understand the difficulties that can arise when you even uh, investigate the term not being or nothing, I want to read out a passage from Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. It's a scene near the end of the play when the servants, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, are taking their master Hamlet uh, on a boat to England. And Rosencrantz is musing on their journey on this boat. So Rosencrantz says, do you think death could possibly be a boat? Guildenstern, no, 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 death is not. Death isn't. You take my meaning. Death is the ultimate negative, not being. You can't not be on a boat. I've frequently not been on boats. No, 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 what you've been is not on boats. He then continues with a very puzzling uh, sentence. He says, the same thing exists for thinking and for being. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean that whatever exists, you think, and whatever you think, 
exists? If so, is Parmenides actually identifying being with the object of thought? If he is, then this is an idea that's had an enormous influence on later Western philosophy and is still hugely influential, particularly amongst European philosophers. So Parmenides now goes on to tell us something about what this being is like, this esti. First of all, it doesn't come into being. This is because uh, if being comes into being, it could only have come into being from nothing. But nothing comes from nothing, says Parmenides. Very famous quote. Even if people haven't heard of Parmenides, they'll probably have heard of the quote, nothing comes from nothing. He's the originator of that. And just as it doesn't come into being, so being, SD, does not go out of being. It doesn't perish either. So it exists in this continuous present. It's unchanging. And it's homogeneous, it's all the same everywhere. It's not a bit more here and a bit less there. It's entirely homogeneous. There is just being. Now it follows from all this that there can be no time, no space, and hence no motion. Uh, all of those are simply part of the world of seeming, the way of seeming that we're going to look at next time. It also follows from this that all the different objects that we think we see in the world around us are also illusions because there is just being. It's unchanging, it's undifferentiated. So all the differences we think we see uh, in shapes, colours, the th things that give rise to different objects, all these are illusions. They're just part of the way of seeming. And the way of truth, if we're going to follow strict logic, Parmenides says, according to the premises of his argument, following the argument through, we are going to get to being. So now let's uh, look at some of the possible problems uh, that arise from this way of truth. Some commentators say, well, OK, you can't think nothing, but you can think about nothing. Um, and they may bring in at this point what is called the sense reference distinction and say, well, the uh, word nothing makes sense even if there is no referent to which the word nothing refers. But I personally think that's a red herring. I think Parmenides is perfectly happy to say, of course, you can think about nothing. I think he's also happy to say that we can think about things that have no corporeal existence, such as uh, mythological centaurs. What he's saying is, I never mind all that, my point is you can't think nothing. So if you are thinking, and we are assuming a thinking subject here, if you are thinking, you've got to be thinking something. And the only thing you can be thinking is being. And secondly, what do we think of Parmenides' claim that the same thing exists for thinking and for being? Because this might strike a number of us as very problematic. Because after all, electricity existed in Parmenides' time, even though nobody was thinking about it because it hadn't been discovered yet. A third very difficult problem is why does Parmenides think that being can't be differentiated into different objects with different characteristics? Now his thought seems to be that you can't say, for example, X is red, because to say X is red implies X is not green. And Parmenides seems to think that any sentence with a not in it is unthinkable illegitimate. But this simply isn't true. Parmenides seems to have moved, we might say illegitimately, from what is termed an existential sense of the verb to be to a predicative sense of the verb to be. Now the existential sense is Socrates is, in the sense that Socrates exists. 
the predicative sense of the verb to be attaches a predicate to that is and says Socrates is short, for example, or Socrates is snub-nosed. So those are two different senses of the verb to be. There are more, but we'll stick to two for now. Now, Parmenides began his argument by saying, being or not being, you think, you think either being or not being, but you can't think not being, therefore you think being. And for that argument to work, he must, or he arguably must be using the verb to be in an existential sense. You can't just close your eyes and think not being, an existential not being. But you can close your eyes and think Socrates is not green or Socrates is not tall. It's perfectly possible to think not being in a predicative sense. So some scholars have argued that Parmenides has slid from using the verb to be in an existential sense in the first part of his argument and arguing correctly that you can't think nothing to then believing that he can say all these things about what being is like and, and he can argue that it is undifferentiated and unchanging and so on but that he actually can't make that second move because that second move depends on him thinking that you can't think not being in a predicative sense but in fact you can. Parmenides I would say is quite correct to argue you can't think nothing, you think being, but that he's not necessarily correct to say that we can't distinguish this being in any way and we can't divide being up into different objects in the world and give those objects different characteristics and indeed changing characteristics. So if there is an illegitimate slide from an existential sense of the verb to be to a predicative sense of the verb to be, the question then arises, is Parmenides aware of this illegitimate slide? And if so, why is he making it? How would that influence our interpretation of the way of truth and its relation to the way of seeming? Some scholars think that he is aware of it. Some scholars think that he's actually the first philosopher who has realised there's a distinction between an existential sense of the verb to be ani in the Greek and a predicative sense of that verb and is making this illegitimate slide to try and persuade us to come to that distinction ourselves. Other scholars say no, he has not yet made that distinction, he's unaware of this move, it's a genuine mistake and those scholars say that the first philosopher who gets close to making the distinction between existential and predicative uses of the verb to be is uh, Plato, who's uh, writing nearly you know, 100 years after Parmenides. But whatever one thinks of where Parmenides stands on whether he's aware of this possibly illegitimate slide, uh, from existential to predicative senses of the verb to be. What does seem clear is that the way of truth is self-refuting because the way of truth is based on those two premises that we looked at, being or not being, and you think. The way of truth assumes differentiated words, it assumes the rules of logic, uh, it assumes a thinking subject, you think. And yet the way of truth concludes with this word being. There's just being. There are no kind of differentiations within this being. And if that's the case, and I admit that this is only one interpretation of the way of truth, but if that's the case, then the way of truth seems to refute itself. And again, we need to ask, is Parmenides aware of this? Is he doing it deliberately? Because if he is aware of it, if he is doing it deliberately, that is greatly going to alter how we interpret what is going on in the way of truth, what Parmenides is up to, and how it's supposed to relate to the way of seeming.
And these are exactly the questions that are going to form the heart of our discussion next time when we look at the way of seeming in more detail. And at the end, we're going to come back to this key question. Uh, if the way of truth is true, why does Parmenides also give us the way of seeming? What is the relationship between the two? And I'm going to give you an interpretation which is pretty radical, but whether you agree with it or not, I hope that you'll enjoy it. So today we're going to continue our exploration of Parmenides. We've already looked at the way of truth and considered some of the problems that arise from it. So it's now time to look at the way of seeming. And of course, the main question is, why does Parmenides write the way of seeming, given that he's already written the way of truth? Why isn't truth enough? Now, I'm going to give you four possible interpretations of what Parmenides is up to. It's going to be possible that more than one of these interpretations might be in play. But first, I want to tell you how Parmenides himself introduces the way of seeming. If you remember, Parmenides has imagined that he's hearing about the way of truth and the way of seeming from a mysterious goddess. And so here is the goddess telling the young Parmenides about why she's going to explain the way of seeming to him. She says, It is proper that you should learn all things, both the unshaken heart of well-rounded truth and the opinions of mortals in which there is no true trust. And later on, when she's finished the way of truth, she says, here I end my trustworthy discourse and thought concerning truth. Henceforth learn the beliefs of mortal men, listening to the deceitful ordering of my words extraordinary. The goddess is telling us that the ordering of her words is going to be deceitful in the way of seeming. Why is she doing this at all? Well, she says, the whole ordering of these, I tell you as it seems fitting, so no thought of mortal men shall ever outstrip you. That's all that she gives us by way of a clue. So we have to try to decipher what is going on. So in the way of seeming, the goddess gives Parmenides what appears to be the most up-to-date scientific account of the cosmos then available in the fifth century BC. And it's an account that is based apparently on binary oppositions, light and dark, male and female, and so on. And quite a few commentators have thought that it's an account that owes a lot to Pythagorean philosophy. So why does the goddess tell Parmenides about this account if she doesn't think it's true? Well, as we've seen, the reason she herself gives is that she doesn't want any other mortal mind to outstrip Parmenides. So perhaps, you know, the, the obvious easy explanation is she simply wants him to be able to hold his own amongst other natural philosophers and not look foolish or uninformed in a debate, even if they're discussing simply the world of appearances and it's not the true world, it's not the way of truth. So that would be the simplest explanation. However, I'm not sure that this really does justice to the goddess telling us that the ordering of her words is going to be deceitful. I think something a bit more complicated might be going on than what the goddess says is going on. So here's another possibility. Maybe the goddess thinks that the way of seeming is actually going to reinforce the way of truth because it's going to be apparent to any intelligent hearer or reader that the way of seeming is based on a number of false premises and false assumptions. Most particularly that it's based on the possibility of these binary oppositions like light and dark. 
Maybe the goddess thinks that these binary oppositions have already been ruled out in the way of truth. Maybe she thinks that these binary oppositions of light and dark, male and female, illegitimately contain both being and not being, both isness and isn'tness. And as we've seen, she's said very clearly that the decision rests in this, either esti or uk esti, either being or not being. Now, as we've seen, if that's what the goddess thinks, if that's the flow of her argument, I'm not sure it's correct because, as we have seen, I think there could be an illegitimate move from an existential sense of the verb to be, it is or it isn't in the sense of it exists or it doesn't exist, a move from that sense of the verb to be to a predicative sense of the verb to be, it is light, it is dark, etc. And it seems to me that if the existential not being has been ruled out in the way of truth, I don't think it follows that a predicative not being has been ruled out. I think it's perfectly possible to say there is just being, but one can have different uh, objects within that being. There can be predicative differences within that being. So there could just be being, but possibly some bits could be light and some bits of it could be dark and some bits could be male and some bits could be female. Personally, I think that's okay. However, the goddess, Parmenides, the author, might not think that's okay. Parmenides, the author, might think that's a real problem. He might think the way of seeming with all these binary oppositions that it contains really has already been proved to be false by the way of truth, in which case he's giving us the way of seeming to reinforce that point, to make it absolutely clear that this is really illogical. It's really not, you know, it's a non-starter. So that would be a second interpretation. We're given the way of seeming to make it crystal clear that the way ordinary scientists think, the way most people think about the world of appearances and different objects and different predicates and change and birth and decay and so on, it is all simply impossible. The way of truth has absolutely ruled it out. So that would be interpretation number two. So far we've looked at two interpretations of the way of seeming which take it for granted that it is simply false. The first interpretation where the goddess says, I'm telling you this Parmenides so that no mortal mind may outstrip you, so that you can be up to date in any scientific uh, discussion that you find yourself taking part in. The second interpretation that she's giving us the way of seeming to reinforce the way of truth, to show that the way of seeming is based on absolutely false premises. It's based on both being and not being, when in fact, of course, the way of truth has said we've got to choose. Now I'm going to take a more radical line, which actually suggests that maybe there is something in this way of seeming, that maybe in some sense we're meant to be taking this seriously and it's adding something. So here's the third interpretation. Maybe the way of truth is actually somehow compatible with the way of seeming. Maybe somehow the appearances of things, all these binary oppositions, the light and the dark, the male and the female and so on, maybe they can somehow be incorporated into being. Now, I think for that to work, and quite a few modern commentators like this interpretation, I think for it to work, we have to assume that Parmenides the philosopher has worked out the difference between the existential sense of the verb to be and the predicative sense of the verb to be, and that he's worked out that the initial bit of the way of truth which says that you can't think nothing, you've got to think something, 
that is fine, but that it doesn't follow from that, that there can be no differentiation within this something, within this being. That in fact, you can divide it up into different objects with different predicates, and that these different objects can change, and they can appear to come out of being and come into being, so long as overall there is just being, and that goes on being, being, and that never changes as being, but within being there is room for the appearances. So that's one possibility, but it does require us to make this very big assumption that Parmenides, the philosopher, the writer, has worked out these different senses of the verb to be and is actually inviting us, the readers, the hearers, to work out this uh, distinction for ourselves and to realise that the appearances can exist as appearances, providing we understand that underneath, as it were, there is just being, even if it looks different on the surface. So that's a pretty radical interpretation, but I've got an even more radical one for you to consider. If Parmenides, the author, is aware that the way of truth is self-refuting in the way that we considered in the last session, if he's aware of that, and if he makes the goddess, his character of the goddess, aware of that, then it might be possible that the way of truth actually needs the way of seeming because the way of truth is not going to get us very far. So here's a thought. Supposing Parmenides, the writer, realises that at the end of the way of truth, if we take it at face value, we have this monist universe, this universe where there's just one thing. And if he thinks that there can't be differentiated objects within that one universe, okay, so if we rule out the third interpretation that we've just been considering, and if we say there's just this one universe and there can't be different people within it and different objects, then you've got a cosmos in which there can't be a goddess talking to the young Parmenides, there can't be words, there can't be language, all the premises of the way of truth, you think, either it is or it isn't, etc, etc, those premises just couldn't exist. So in the very strictest sense, we might have an argument in the way of truth, which quite literally refutes itself, i.e. the conclusion of the argument, this monist universe, where there's just one thing being, undifferentiated, simply cancels out the premises that the whole argument is based on, because the premises included more than one thing. They included Parmenides and the goddess, they included the, the use of language, the use of logic and so on. So in the very strictest sense, maybe it is self-refuting. Then the question is, is Parmenides aware of that? And then the third question is, if Parmenides, the author, is aware of that, is he allowing the goddess to be aware of that? And if the answer is yes to all those three questions, we might have an argument which is known by Parmenides to be self-refuting, which is deliberately self-refuting. Well, why? Why on earth would he do that? Why on earth would he say truth refutes itself? Let's consider where we started. At the very beginning, I suggested that it was helpful to look at Parmenides' project in terms of seeing, let's see how far we can get from first principles using reason alone. A kind of project in a way similar to Descartes' later project, I think therefore I am. Let's see where we can get from first principles and just using our human reason. How far can we get? Parmenides now might be saying, well, actually, we can't get very far. 
reason on its own can't tell us very much about the world. It really can't. So if that's the case, what can we rely on or what can we turn to to help us understand the world around us? Well, if reason ends up refuting itself, then we'll have to turn to our sense organs. We're going to have to turn to sense data and see where that gets us. Where would that get us? The way of seeming. So on this very radical interpretation, the way of truth is known to be self-refuting. We then say, OK, reason is not very adequate. It's not very helpful, or certainly not on its own. We need our sense data. We need to see what our senses can tell us. And so then we turn to the way of seeming, which is exactly how the world appears to us, full of light and shade and night and day and different objects and objects which change and have different properties and come into being and go out of being. This is how the world appears to us. But, says Parmenides, there may be a problem there as well, because yes, this is what our senses tell us, but this way of seeming appears to go against the laws of logic as I've set them out in the way of truth. It appears to flout the law of non-contradiction. It appears to rest on being and not being. When I've told you, you've got to choose between being or not being. If this is the case, and it only can be the case if Parmenides thinks that the way of seeming really is illogical and really can't be incorporated into the way of truth. So this interpretation is going to rule out the third interpretation. It's, it's, it can't make the way of seeming compatible with the way of truth in that way. If this is the case and the way of seeming is deemed to be illogical, flouting the, the laws of reason, then we've got a real problem on our hands. We've got a real dialectical dilemma because we've got two ways of trying to find out about the world. We've got our reason, but that's a problem because it looks like it comes up with a view of being which is ultimately self-refuting. Or we can turn to our sense organs and see what sense data tell us. But then that's a problem because sense data appear to flout the laws of reason. So what do we do? We've got this circular argument. Now on this very radical interpretation, this might be why Parmenides says, it matters not to me where I begin because I shall return there again. This might even be why he says that truth is a sphere, truth is spherical. We've got this circular argument going on that he's saying, I'm going to pose you a real problem here. You want to find out about the world? You're going to have to rely on either your reason or your sense organs or both. But there's problems with both your reason and your sense organs. What are you going to do? If we are attracted to this interpretation, then we've got Parmenides not so much as a metaphysician, but Parmenides as a dialectician. Now, we know that Parmenides taught Zeno. The later Greek philosopher Aristotle tells us that Zeno was the first dialectician. But on this very radical fourth interpretation that I'm suggesting to you, just to think about, maybe actually Zeno's teacher, Zeno's master, Parmenides, was the first dialectician. Now, I don't know which of these four possible interpretations is correct, and there may be more interpretations. You may be able to think up some of your own. Uh, interpretation one and two could go together. It is possible that the goddess is saying, I don't want any mortal mind to outstrip you, and when you really get into the way of seeming, you'll see how it rests on false premises. You'll see how, in fact, the way of seeming reinforces the truth of the way of truth because the way of seeming reveals itself to be false. 
So interpretation one could go together with interpretation two. Interpretation three and interpretation four, the really radical ones that I've been discussing, I think stand alone. I, I think if you're going to say actually the way of truth could be compatible with the way of seeming, that we can actually incorporate the appearances into being, then that's a standalone interpretation. And this extremely radical final uh, viewpoint, which suggests that Parmenides is actually saying, I'm going to give you a dilemma. I'm going to say to find out about the world, you need to use either your reason or your uh, sense uh, organs or both but actually there's a problem with both your reason and with your sense organs and what they tell you. I'm just going to set up this dialectical dilemma for you. I think that interpretation stands alone. So lots for you to think about. Ancient philosophy may have happened a long time ago, but it is still live. It's still being debated. It's, people can't quite work out what the pre-Socratics were up to, but of course that's part of the fun. And we're going to look now at what the legacy of Parmenides is. So in terms of Parmenides' legacy, it really is impossible to overstate how important he's been to Western philosophy, and still is. First of all, it's true that he shows us that we cannot think nothing. To think nothing is simply not to be thinking. However, he certainly makes us think about nothing. He certainly makes us think about negative predications. And these are really troubling, difficult ideas. There's a really crucial distinction between the sense of a word and the reference of a word. And Parmenides is saying to us, this word nothing, it has sense. If I say nothing, you know what I mean, but there's no reference for it. You can't point to nothing. The word table has sense and you can point to a table. The word nothing has sense, but you can't point to it. It's really, really weird. It functions as a noun in a sentence, but there is no object to which you can point. And that's why, to return to where we started at the very beginning of our first session on Parmenides, that's why the sentences, quote, nothing exists, unquote, and quote, nothing does not exist, unquote, that's why these sentences are so strange, so bizarre. But, and as we've seen, there's a sense in which Parmenides is absolutely right. Look at the language. How can you say that isn'tness is? It makes no sense. And just as he gets us to think about the, the puzzles uh, around nothing and negative predications, so he also gets us to think about the puzzles surrounding the concept of being and to be ani in the Greek. Because in its very broadest sense, the concept of being must somehow embrace, cover all its different senses. The existential sense that we looked at, Socrates is, Socrates exists. The predicative sense, Socrates is short, Socrates is snub-nosed. And there's also a veridical sense of the verb to be this sentence is true, for instance, whether something is true or not. But all these different senses of the verb to be, and yes, of course, it's important to distinguish them. And we've seen in these two sessions on Parmenides how vital it is to distinguish these different senses in order to understand the problems in his way of truth and his way of seeming. But once you've made the distinctions, You've also got to think, well, what is it about the existential sense of the verb to be and the predicative sense and the veridical sense that makes them all being? What is this overall concept of being that includes all these different senses?
So if you really start to study Parmenides and think deeply about him, you'll realise that not only is he going to start you on a lifelong puzzle about nothing, he's also going to start you on a lifelong journey into the problems surrounding being. And as we've just seen, he prompts us to think about both reason and sense experience and the respective roles that they play in the acquisition of knowledge. And also, if we've got problems with both reason and sense experience, as Parmenides suggests, where do we go to? Is there any way we can find out about anything? So he sets us a real puzzle there. And finally, and this is a new point, Parmenides gets us to think about how to start an argument. Because as we've seen in the way of truth, he tries to start from first principles. And he thinks that one principle is you think, and another is being or not being. But supposing that's the problem, supposing starting from first principles is the problem, supposing that all we can do as mere mortals, is to start from where we currently are in time and space and with our current beliefs. And we have to work towards first principles. Start from where we are, work towards first principles, and then start again and see if starting from those first principles, we, have, we get back to where we first began or whether we get to somewhere quite different. In other words, there may be a profound methodological problem in the way of truth. Maybe the goddess shouldn't have started or tried to start from first principles. Now, the question then is, does Parmenides, the author, also think that that's a problem? Is he aware of this? Is he conscious that this is a methodological problem? Is he trying to get us to work this out for ourselves and say, actually, we need to start from where we are now. We need to start from our current beliefs and work towards first principles. So that's a fifth possible uh, legacy that I think Parmenides gives us and a really important one. How do you start an argument?